our final guest um, now this afternoon uh, is the dean of the uh, Dell Medical School that has now been here for nearly five years well, four? four geez yeah. it's <laughs> it seems like yesterday but it certainly it um, has become such a fundamental resource for uh, both university and the community uh, dr. Clay Johnston is um, really been such an innovative uh, thinker and someone who has really committed to making Austin a model healthy city and we really appreciate you coming today to tell us, uh, you know, how are you going to train all these new folks to do this to stuff? To do all this stuff. Yeah, yes, yeah. so, and it's a pleasure. So that was, and I really enjoyed that uh, that panel and the little bit of the panel before that that I that I got to hear. I wish I had been here all morning. And uh, I want to thank you all too for convening here and talking about these important topics and how we all work together to address them. And that was one of the key questions: is you know we're all coming from our different silos. How do we work together to approach these problems? We're not going to succeed in our separate uh, silos, which I, I agree with completely. So, so first of all, it, before I get to the education part, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the healthcare system because I think that education is all about the healthcare system, the health system. I'm going to say because it's not just about the care that happens in clinics and, and hospitals; it's about what happens outside. And if we don't start by examining our current system, we can't ask a question of, well, what are we missing today in, the, in what we do as a medical school, and, um, and where should that go, which also we should anticipate if we're going to be thoughtful about how we educate. So, um, so first of all, I mean, I don't really have to say much because you all know it already, and that last panel covered a ton of the things that, that make our healthcare, our health system so broken. Um, you know, one of my favorite uh, pieces of data is the uh, that um, our healthcare spending is substantially higher than any other country. So we're now at uh, $10,800 per person on, on, uh, on average in the, in the U.S., which is about 30% higher than Switzerland. And yet our health outcomes by WHO rankings are, are right at Cuba. Um, so we rank 34th, and that's an, a, a, an array of different health measures that are, that are composed to create that, that, uh, that measure. Um, but then, you know, when we talk about, and you heard the numbers that a third of the healthcare dollar is, is waste, that comes from a couple of different analyses that suggested that the National Academy of Medicine was the one who really published that number. But um, remember, we spend $10,800. Well, Cuba spends $800 a person. So then one has to ask the question, well, how much is it then that's waste? Um, and even if we look at healthcare systems that we might um, that might look and feel a little like ours. Um, the UK comes to mind, so the English system. So the English system actually, by World Health Organization rankings, ranks up right at the top. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, one, two, three, up in there. Um, and the, um, the Commonwealth Fund just did a reanalysis and put the UK at the top for, for its health care system, not just its health system. Um, well, they spend a third of what we spend. Now they complain that the prices are going up, um, but in general they're satisfied with um, whoops, with the health care that they provide and um, uh, that they're given. Um, and they're, you know, again, their outcomes are substantially better than ours. So how much is waste? I don't know, but a lot of it is waste. Um, and um, in, in, in it's a system too that doesn't innovate. It's a system that doesn't identify opportunities to remove waste, to pr produce better outcomes, and to lower costs, and to um, disseminate those widely across the, the ecosystem, right? So it's, it, 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 it fails in a lot of different respects. Technology is another good example of that. So technology um, that, you know, you're, you're, you're the power of the cell phone is one that example that people give. Um, the other is just the cost of a computer and what you get from that computer. It's gone way down. Uh, and you get so much more from it. And every single industry has become more efficient because of that, except for healthcare, which has become less efficient. We've used it as a tool to increase billing. We've had a whole bunch of dif dif uh, additional intermediaries in that. We haven't really seen much improvement in quality. That's where the promise is, and yet it's been directed towards something else. Electronic health record, probably emblematic of, of technology um, and the introduction of technology into, into healthcare. 
is, is the, either the number one or number two reason physicians give for being dissatisfied. And their physicians are more dissatisfied today than they've ever been in the past. Rates of burnout continue to increase and, um, and more physicians than not don't recommend medicine as a career choice for, for their own children. Oh my goodness, you know. So we're, the, the, the field is in, is in disarray. The health system is in, is in disarray. And, and that's where we arrive. So we're, we're totally different. Most of you all are from Austin, so you know our, our, our birth story. Um, but it really comes from this community. So you know, we wouldn't be here without the population of, of Travis County voting to increase their property tax to bring the med school to life. Um, we don't, we can't find any other example of where people <laughs> have done that. Um, and they, they wouldn't have done it in San Francisco, where I came from. Um, it says something great about this community, but it also creates a connection and obligation that we have that's, uh, that's a really, really special thing. Um, it says that we don't exist to do ivory tower stuff, that we, in our tie to this community, have an obligation to figure out this health system. And you know the, the um, story about how the Parkland system works is it, that's a wonderful perspective to have, and that's one that we have with uh, with Central Health, the county healthcare district here, and our our close partner um, and funder. And that that tells you, okay, you got a fixed number of dollars, and you have all these people that you really care about, and you want them to be as healthy as they possibly can be. How can you allocate those resources most effectively? Um, and you won't get it right the first time. So how do you create a system that continuously innovates and pushes things forward? And that last piece, we don't really have that. I give, sometimes I give the example of the hospital gown. The hospital gown is this horribly dehumanizing thing that has no real purpose. And it's been in the healthcare system for over 100 years unchanged. Um, what, kind of, what does that say about our, our health system that we can't identify things so simple that the, an innovation would be, you know, a t-shirt and boxer shorts, and somehow we can't, we, we know this, right, but we can't, it, it doesn't disseminate, it doesn't catch it, we don't, is it that we are not as connected to the people that we care for enough to care about how, how they're respected? Um, you know, it's, it's, such, it's such a bizarre disconnect. So, um, in fee-for-service exacerbates all of this because it focuses us on doing more. And as we've become better businesses, as hospitals, insurance plans, um, uh, uh, all provider groups have become better businesses, they've learned how to milk more dollars out of the system. And more intermediaries have come to play in that system. We're very good at entrepreneurship, but it's all been focused on how we pull more out of a fee-for-service system. And the way to do that is to drive more service. And it, when people tell you, well, tell us about your quality, say, yeah, you know, we got that. When they come to tell you, well, how is there waste in your system? You know, we got that. Um, and not to be transparent about those things and to create any sort of competition that would drive down costs and improve outcomes. So that's kind of the, that's the sort of sad state of affairs. I mean, we're all saying the same thing, right? And we're all feeling that. So then the question first becomes, well, how could the healthcare system look different and what would the role of academic medicine be in that new system? So the first part of that has to be, well, what should care look like and what's our role? So um, generally, and we are charged with being part of the safety net care system for, uh, for Travis County. Academic medicine generally takes that on, sometimes more, sometimes less. We, we take that on, we, we love that part of our mission. Um, and filling gaps in the, in the community to provide that care. So, so we, we're gonna have that, right, as, as one of our goals. Um, but, but we don't want, um, we don't wanna be focused on fee-for-service. We wanna be focused, just as I said, on the, on the health of people. So where do we start? So where we start is by saying, we don't care about fee-for-service. And we're fortunate that Central Health's given us some time and the way that we work with them and also the support that we get has given us some time to figure this out. But where we start is we focus on the person. And I'm not saying the patient, I'm saying the person. Because I, there are very few people that really want to be patients. Um, and even if we're, if we're sick, we don't want to be treated like a patient. We want to still be treated like a person. So I really do mean person. And 
And then when you start with the person, then it changes your perspective about what we're here to do. This is not easy work because there are all these traditions and years of doing things a certain way. But if we, can, if we think about how it could be better, and we use processes like human-centered design, which is core to our approach, um, and I, I won't go into details about how we think about that, but you listen to people, you watch them, you get feedback, you realize they're individuals, they're not all the same. You adapt and individualize the way you approach things. Then you use that to create the ideal system for the person. So what do people want? They want health. They want a much better experience. They want, you know, just as we've said, they, they, want, um, they want access. They, they want to be treated like a person. They don't want to have to wait 40 minutes. The average wait in, a, in an emergency, or not even emergency room, in a doctor's office, the average wait is, is uh, 40 minutes. When they do have to see the doctor, they don't want 12 minutes. That's the average um, office visit length. Um, doctor doesn't want that either. If they need to see a doctor, they want that, that time to be, to be longer. They want you to care about their health, but they also don't want you, and we don't, as people, being careful, we don't want our resources wasted. The insurance um, encourages us, or has allowed us to ignore uh, resources being wasted. Now, less so that we own that, but we also have to recognize we don't want the person before us wasting our resources, right? Because we're all paying into the same pool. So effectively, we are owning the cost, and we should not have systems that waste resources. We should be, we, we don't do that, you know, you go to the auto shop, you don't want them to throw in the extra spark plugs just because they're there, you know. You don't need those spark plugs, don't put them in, you know. That, you, every other system, again, adapts to eliminate waste. We haven't done that in healthcare. So, so that focus on the person then changes how you approach problems. So I'll, you, and you can't just do this, boom, you're going to do it for everything. It's too hard. The work is really hard. But for us, we started with joint pain. So, and let me, it sounds kind of weird why you start with joint pain, with diabetes or, or, or mental health issues. Those are all really important have a great burden, but it ends up that there's, there's huge waste in joint pain, and it's a tremendous expenditure. It's one of uh, uh, CMS's major expenditures. And also, we had a wait list um, at, uh, in the central health population, so the safety net here in Austin, um, of over a year. It was 14 months for patients to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. So that's a, that's a huge long waste. There were 1,500 people on that wait list. 1,500 people. So, um, so it, was a, it, it, it was a priority for, for us here in Austin. We also happened to have the guy who helped to create the bundle for, um, for joint pain surgery. So this is just the surgery. A guy named Kevin Bozick, who's an um, orthopedic surgeon. He heads up surgery for us. Uh, Harvard MBA had done that work with Medicare. So he already knew about it, knew the importance of value was um, why we brought him here. Um, and we had the Design Institute for Health, you know, these great design people. We had a pers the person, Elizabeth Teisberg, who wrote the book with Michael Porter about healthcare value, defined that term. Um, so they're all on the team. They come together, they create a, a brand new model for joint pain. And I do mean joint pain. So seeing the patient when they first complain of pain, not when they're set up for surgery. Um, those were actually, by the way, the patients that were in the wait list to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and they completely redesigned that care, has a telemedicine front end. Um, you contact, pay, you use the, the data that you have to do some triage up, up front. Um, it's team-based care, uh, it's a very interprofessional. Um, and we track outcomes, including patient reported outcomes, very, very carefully. And we track resource consumption very carefully. Um, that program now has been going for about a year and a quarter. The outcomes are substantially better than they were before, no matter how you measure them, by the patient's reports of, of, of being ambulatory, by pain reports, um, by links of stay in the hospital, by where they get discharged, by outcomes from surgery. All those outcomes are, are substantially better. And the costs, I can't, they won't let me say how much lower, but they are substantially lower, um, substantially lower, primarily because most of those folks <coughs> can do better without surgery than with surgery, and there's a strong incentive to do surgery even in people who don't, who can, who through weight loss, uh, uh, counseling, um, physical therapy, all those things that they really need, 
smoking cessation, all those things that are not paid for well in the fee-for-service system that are part of what we do, um, that those are the things that people really need, not a surgery. Um, and still plenty of surgeries. There was no one who, who said, I need surgery, that we said, no, you can't have that, so no denial wasn't done through that mechanism. So that's been a, a really successful program, it shows us how to do that. It's a, it's a beautiful product, right? It's in, the experience is way better as well, by the way. It's a, you know, patients uh, feel, they're, they're, the team kind of comes around them, and um, so they feel sort of engulfed in this care, as opposed to having to move around through a, a broken system. So that's one area. One has to reproduce that in many areas to be successful. But it is potentially disseminatable in an interesting way. It is a better product. It is better outcomes, a better experience, lower cost. We gotta figure out how to get people to it and how to get it paid for based on value. We lose money in a fee-for-service system on this thing. Um, and we don't care because it's the right thing to do. But that's not sustainable. We can't create a disseminatable system if, it, if, if there's not some uh, ability to take probably one of the most broken areas and have some margin held onto by the provider group. Otherwise, it'll never scale. So we have to figure out how we get it paid for differently and how we scale beyond Austin. And those become challenges for us, but then it keeps us focused on innovation, how to create more and more of these. And you can imagine, like that lens crafters, you can imagine us creating, uh, it wouldn't be us, some other entity creating a joint pain uh, system of care, like I just described, and moving that around. You know, now it's in Kansas City, now it's in Omaha, now we just opened up in Denver. And in undercutting, because it's a better product, what exists in those places. And you can imagine doing that in multiple areas, you know, care for diabetes, care for mental health disorders, all those things as well. So that's sort of how we, how we see it playing out. Okay, so that's a different future. I'm sorry that took so long, I haven't even gotten to education yet, but there's a different future. And to train then physicians to get us to that different future, it's gotta be different, right? Um, more important to see that future than it is to see the specifics of our training but the doctors of today got us into this system that we have. I mean, I, they didn't alone, but you know, they're thought leaders in the system, right? And didn't at least keep us from evolving to the system. So we need leadership. Um, and so we need to train leadership and look for future <coughs> leaders when we select students. Um, we need better communication skills. Um, we need to teach team-based care and team-based learning and that way of leading. Leading not from on the boss, but from the, around the table. How do we enable each other to find solutions to these problems? We need to select based on creativity and then train more for it. And entrepreneurism then becomes part of that. Social determinants are absolutely critical. So how do we get people to really understand that? We've got to put our, our trainees out in the community. We like to pick students who already care about the health in their community, to have that passion to do that. Um, their uh, human-centered design, I mentioned as well, and data and technology is another key component. So those are all new things that aren't part of any other medical school, or they're little, little segments here or there that people do, um, but they're big parts of ours, so where do we get the room? Well, traditional med school, what I did, was, is what's done pretty much everywhere, is two years of sitting in a room like this, uh, talking head up here, memorizing stuff so you can be tested on it. That's the, that's the way I learned. Um, we don't do that um, because the knowledge isn't as valuable anymore. That was when, if I didn't know something, I had to go to the library and look it up or you know, pull a textbook off the shelf. Um, knowledge is cheaper and cheaper. A cell phone is now the number one, Google on a cell phone, number one reference for physicians. Um, and it is way more reliable than their memory if they don't know something already. And most of the facts that they, they deal with on a daily basis, they already have in their brains. So memorization is less important. That opens up a whole year for us. We take two years, we scrunch it down to one, and that adds an additional year for um, an innovation leadership discovery block, we call it. And they work on projects that have the potential to improve health during that time. Multidisciplinarity is really critical to us, wonderful at UT. So we pull in to the possibility for them to get uh, dual degrees. A um, number of them will get MPHs, MBAs. Uh, those are the two most popular. We don't yet have something going with you all, but we hope to, um, uh, to make that an option as well. So um, we think those are the characteristics to get to the, the key players, the leaders. Not every physician needs this, the training that I described. They need more of it, but not as much as we provide. 
But our role, given the particular position that we're in, really is about how we train leaders. That's the way we see it. Um, we're in this very special position here. Um, we're taking advantage of that very special position. We want students who are going to take advantage of that. We want faculty who are going to take advantage of that and all have that synergized to the greatest potential to have impact on a very, very broken system. So thank you. With that, I'm happy to take questions. That would be great. Yeah. 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 Test. Yeah. Well, I would just say the obvious question is how do we get more medical schools to do what you're doing? Well, first of all, we have to show that what we're doing is going to work. Um, and, um, but I'll tell you, it's working in terms of who we draw. So in terms of the faculty that we've drawn, um, I mean, we, we should not have the faculty that we have here. I mean, Austin's a wonderful city. and. UT's a great school, but we have people, you know, the leaders in this stuff from all over the country who have come here. So that's partly that, you know, being as audacious as saying we're going we're gonna to take this on. Um, and it also is true for the medical students. So we, we, we are getting now about 5,000 applicants and we have 50 slots. So it's a 1% chance, which makes us the, uh, the, the second most selective medical school in the country. Um, and that's, I mean, we're brand new. Um, and, um, and, and we're there. So the students are, we're drawing the students that we want. They look like what we want too. They're, you know, they come from Teach for America or uh, some of, we've had some really interesting folks that have been in the military for a while or they come in from public service and other jobs to come and, and do medicine. It's a fascinating uh, group. So all that's working. It feels like the education's working. The students are starting to work on on big projects and uh, not just on caring for patients in front of them. They have to do that well as also, by the way. We're not like saying you don't have to be a, a, you know, a real doctor. You have, they have to be great <laughs> clinicians too. But they also have to do this other stuff and, it, and they're starting to work on those projects. We're measuring everything. And so we are sharing that data with other schools. I'll tell you, the, there are other schools that are now starting to, to talk the way we do. The, the one that's the closest is one at Kaiser. So Kaiser's opened a new, is opening a new med school, and they have come to visit us a couple of times, and um, they're great, we love them. They have a, a really nice laboratory to work in there in terms of thinking about new models, and they've done that. Um, and so, uh, you know, that'd be, a, I think, a wonderful environment to, to train folks with similar notions. How are you making sure to stay accountable to the community since, as you said, this was paid for by taxpayers? Yeah. Yeah, so in just first of all, it is, it's that the support we get from the taxpayers is absolutely critical. We could not exist without that. But it only it accounts for now about um, a, a little over a quarter of our revenue. So we have lots of other revenue sources, and that will continue to, to increase and change over time. Um, which is good. You want that. You don't want us to just be on taxpayer shoulders. You want us to figure out that how this model works so we can direct some of those dollars too to pay for those who can't pay fruit through other means, right? So, um, so we're doing that work. So how do we stay accountable? Well, um, we, for one thing, we have to, we, you know, we have to look at what it is that we're, we're delivering, what the value is that we produce for this community. And um, so we, we are doing that with Central Health. Uh, Maram's right there to, uh, um, and is one of those people that uh, helps us to do that. Um, but you know, we look at each, the, the value of each of the aspects of, of our mission and how it aligns with, uh, with community's interests. For Central Health, it's more about delivery of care, but, if, but there are also the, the economic aspects, the delivery of services. Um, to, to those with insurance, all those things that were promised in Prop 1 as well. And so we have to look at that as well. Um, but, uh, um, you know, we, we take that stuff very seriously. And, um, you know, if you look at the, we call the, the value stack, it's still in excess already of, of what we receive on an annual basis. And that should, that should only increase um, over time. Yeah. How are you training the Hold students? On. How are you training? <laughs> how are you training the students to look at the social determinants and those factors? I work at Seton Shoal Creek. We see a lot of residents who um, come in a little bit 
uh, green to some of those factors that yeah. really influence the mental health population? I think all populations, right? I, th I think it, you know, it's a critical point. The, the, so we have residents as well, I should say. We have about 300 residents. We've in, increased that number. Those, they existed here before I, I arrived. Um, but they were about 240, now we're up to 300, so we've increased that number. But the, um, the, the, in the residencies, because they existed here before, are gonna take longer to transition and um, uh, in, in more work. We are working on that. Um, the economic model that supports residents is also more difficult for us to change. It's funded by the hospital. It, the funds flow from the federal government through the hospital, and the hospital has expectations for, for labor from the same residents. So, how we direct them and train them is, is an issue. But um, in terms of social determinants, you asked about our medical students, that we do control. So it is a, it's a core part of our curriculum. They do, um, it, you can't just teach folks that those are things that are important. You have to actually get them out into community settings. So most of our outpatient care is actually in the community. Community care um, is our primary partner for for, uh, for their clinical rotations. The Southeast Health and Wellness Center is a major teaching site for that. But then we do longitudinal family type uh, um, uh, 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 where they're, they're actually in longitudinal clinics um, as well all four years. So that gives them more exposure too. Um, yeah, I was just on quality rounds in the hospital and um, the, you know, we looked at um, eight different patients um, four of those patients had avoidable hospitalizations just because the social determinants weren't addressed. When I heard the presentations on rounds, no one mentioned any of that. So we have a long way to go. Yes. Okay. Last question. Okay. Thank you, Dean, for uh, a very interesting presentation. Um, as, a, as a fellow physician, I just wanted to suggest that at the beginning when we talked about the physician burnout and, uh, <clears throat> and you know, the stresses, it's been my experience that it's not about the dollars coming in, or it's not even even about just the insurance companies. It's kind of really been the you know the electronic health records helped us a lot in terms of storing data and re retrieving data and so forth. But the fact that doctors have to spend so much time there, much more time than the act we spend with patients, I think, has really added to this. I think we're at some very awkward interface between where we where technology will take us at some point where we can actually have more time with the patient. So right. any comments about that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the, the major reason physicians don't like it is they haven't seen it. They've seen more data, but they've seen the cut and paste stuff and a lot of junky stuff in there. They haven't seen it improve quality the way we had all hoped. And, um, and it, but primarily it's because of what you've said. They spend more time, it depends on which survey you look at, either as much time as seeing patients or twice as much time as seeing patients. But either way, it's more time than they're seeing patients. And, and it's rushed and feels unnecessary. The reality is, too, a lot of it has been focused on billing, how to upcode and billing. Again, focused on this fee-for-service and how to not on what key information needs to be conveyed to another physician, which is what, what it used to be when it was a paper record. So all of those things are, are, are negatives. Um, physicians want to spend more quality time with patients, um, and they're not, and that is one major reason why they aren't. I agree, though. We're, you know, it's something we focused on as well. How do we, how do we improve that? Um, we and just super quick, the um, uh, we one of the when we were redesigning that joint pain care, it was obvious that the electronic health record was getting in the way of of, of as meaningful an encounter as it could be. And so the group found a, um, the design group uh, found, we've been doing some stuff with I, uh, MIT Media Lab, a spin out from I, MIT Media Lab that does um, laboratory notebooks on the fly, at, you know, why we need a company to do this, I don't know. But they, you know, the folks from MIT had decided laboratory no notebooks was a major problem. Listening in the background, they could fill them out. So we took that company and said, well, this could work great in the clinic, and we trained it over, it took about, 45 days to, to take what the physician was doing and saying and put that into electronic record for the whole exam. So now we're you know, developing that company. And whether we're the ones who, who, who win that, what will be a, a race or not, is irrelevant. That problem will get solved. Yeah, so I think that will improve things a lot.
Great. Well, I would let you continue to talk for as long as you would like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I did promise your team that we would have you out at 12.30, and I'm two minutes behind, so okay. I don't want to uh, be disrespectful. But uh, I really appreciate uh, your conversation with us today, and please join me in thanking you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.